Hi again, everybody. Welcome to this next Handbooks podcast. I'm Paul Kengor. Steve Cunningham is the producer. And we have Julia Maloney with us this week. And she's she's done a, a fantastic book on the St. Gallen Mafia, t- titled The St. Gallen Mafia. And this is a subject that, that a lot of Catholics have been very intrigued by, have wanted to know about, wanted to understand better. I have too. And, and I'll say right off that that if, for a book to be done on this in in a in a way that I think is so readable, so so lively and and so fair, so so level headed, and not a book that that goes out to take shots at Pope Francis, but just you know, really written very well. That this is it. So I think this is the book on the subject, the book that needed to be written. But before going through all of that, let me welcome here Julia Maloney. How are you? I'm doing great, Paul. Thank you so much for having me. Sure thing. So tell us a little bit first about yourself before before you go into this, before we talk about the book. And so I've read you at Crisis Magazine for, I guess, a few years now. I don't know how long you've been writing for Crisis. It seems like a while, a little while. And so tell, tell us a little bit about your background, where you're from. Yeah, um, so I am a cradle Catholic, um, uh, originally from Colorado, and I just grew up in a really great Catholic family um, and went off to Yale and Harvard to study English literature. Um, I focused on the Middle Ages. Um, So I was actually like my senior essay at Yale was on St. Catherine of Siena. So I tried to kind of, I was, you know, in in kind of a hostile cultural Marxist center, but um, tried to kind of hide out and do medieval studies. So um, So, I... So what what time was that? When were you there at Yale? um, I was there in the early 2000s. And then um, then I took a, a couple years off to teach high school literature. And then I went... Um, to grad school um, to Harvard to get my master's degree in English literature as well. Did you did you by chance know Michael Knowles at Yale? I don't know if you if you were in the same years or not. No, I I did not know him at Yale, unfortunately. No, okay. because he was he was in a similar area, I think, and even did um, I think Italian literature, I believe. And and but this is one of the questions I was going to ask you. You 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 must read or speak Italian. Yes, no. I um I have a reading knowledge of several languages. I can I can have a dictionary and translate it, but I I don't really speak any other. I, I'm very bad at speaking the languages. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it's one thing. So I, I'm like this with Italian. I I can read it and and speak it a little bit if I practice it, but. But it, but it's hard, right, off the cuff to just sort of break, break into a language. But 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 did did you did you read some of these books in the original Italian? It looks like maybe you did some of the books on Francis. Um, yes. So th- there are a lot of um, books, especially the ones on Martini, that you you, you can't get them in translation. Right. So um, and and there were a number of French books too. There was a really yes. good French book by Nicholas Diot that was kind of, it, it was a major source for a lot of these revelations. So, so yes, I would, I would just read them in the original and, um, and, and for most of them, I, I, I just did like a paraphrase of like in the, in the actual writing of the book, the footnotes, as you know, are so dense. Um, right. There's like six, six or seven footnotes a page. And so I would just kind of summarize for the reader what was going on in there. And they and they and they are indeed footnotes rather than endnotes. In fact, a lot yes. of a lot of people in in books today use endnotes, and I think footnotes are are better. They're more transparent, right? People can yeah. look right at the very bottom and check your source right away. A lot of people won't flip to the back with with endnotes. But um, but some people also feel that that um, that footnotes are more distracting, right? But I, I prefer them, and and especially mm-hmm. it, it really it really shows. I think that it gives you an immediate feel for how much you've read, how well read you are on this, the, the, the scholarly feel to it, and the uh, and, and you and you refer a number of times to to uh, Vaticanistas, people like Sandro mm-hmm. Magister. 
who I go, I visit his website and a lot of them you can, you can translate right away when you go to the website, but, but, but some of them are not, not translated and you really kind of need to read them in the original language to get a sense of exactly what they're saying. Yes. Yes, exactly. Um, this was the sort of book. Um, I think that some of these linguistic issues are some of the reason why we, you know, several years ago when I thought about this project, I, I wondered why no one had taken this project yet because to me, you know, the way I framed it to my family when I thought about this was um, if I could write a book, I would write it about the St. Gallen Mafia. That's, right. That was the one thing that I wanted to write about. And I thought it was just the most fascinating subject in the entire world. And I think that, um, you know, there are some sources, if, if I could say, you know, one gap in the book is definitely that um, I don't have any reading knowledge of German. And so <clears throat> there are um, key German members, of course, but Dr. Micah Hickson, at LifeSite News and a lot of other people have, you know, read a lot of these texts and summarized them for us. So I had to kind of rely on other people for that. But it's definitely a project that, um, you know, I, you know, as much as I've tried to kind of collect things in this book, I feel like this is a starting point, hopefully for, some, you know, maybe someone else will get interested in this and do it their own deep dive into some of these sources or asking similar questions as well. Yeah. And so I'm sort of jumping ahead, but, and, and I, I've wondered why no one else tackled this, why no one else jumped into this. And, and um, obviously you were wondering the same thing, right? Why hasn't anybody written about this, including, I, I could think of a lot of really anti-Francis writers on the on the mm -hmm. Catholic side and you know some of which are <laughs> good friends of mine that I don't I don't know why they didn't take this on it, uh, do you have any any idea any theories as to why 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 you were first why someone else didn't beat you to it um I I think that um the the Dictator Pope, when it came out, um, the first chapter, of course, was called the St. Gallen Mafia. Right. And right. he did he did such a good job with that, that um, in a sense, it probably made people feel satisfied that most of the story had been told. Um, that's one theory that I have um, about it, because I, I was, after that book came out, I wrote my first article on the St. Gallen Mafia. It was on Martini. It was called The Man Who Was Antipope. And it was in Crisis Magazine. And um, that article, th that was the beginning of this for me, because I started, I wrote like six or seven different St. Gallen Mafia articles before I even wrote this book. Yeah, I read those. I read those. And the uh, yeah, the the dictator pope that was by um, Mark Antonio Colana, right? Who, who's mm -hmm. really, mm -hmm. I think, sire Henry Sire, I believe, yes. is, is the um, a member of the Knights of Malta, and 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 who had, by the way, Mark Antonio Colana was a major figure in the Battle of Lepanto, and in 1571. Mm -hmm. So it's very interesting that that he that he that he picked that pen name. But yeah, I, other than that, I can't really think of anything else that anybody really did, right, that stands out other than some articles, perhaps. Exactly. I mean, I know that definitely um, on the other side, Austin Ivory wrote about the St. Gallen Mafia for his book, The Great Reformer. Um, and he, of course, for anyone who doesn't know, he's the former spokesman for Connor, uh, so, sorry, Cardinal Cormac Murphy O'Connor, who yes. was part of the St. Gallen Mafia. So he had an insider's look and he kind of got himself into trouble saying some things in there that he retracted later on. But um, aside aside from those those two texts and articles, we th th there was a big gap in this area, definitely. So, all right, let me back up a little bit more. So you're at Yale, and uh, I, I could show you on my wall right here. I don't know if I should try it. There, there's St. Catherine of Siena. 
So, oh, she, yeah. But she she is she's one of my favorite saints. But so you you did your you did you did your thesis your senior thesis on Catherine of Siena. Yes, I did. It, yeah. Had, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna um, say there was. Um, so she had her her dialogue. Um, and it was translated into Middle English um, for some nuns in the uh, late fifteenth century or so, um, and it was called re- it was called the Orchard of Zion. And um, so basically, it, it was about Saint Catherine and her book, but also about its reception in England by medieval nuns and and how it had been rearranged by a by a, the middle english translator so that was kind of the angle that i was that i was um, taking on that book okay and then then you go to harvard for your masters yeah and then and so so what what followed what followed after that you st- you started so, writing i guess ma- mainly for publications i think this, i think this is your first book correct this is my first book. Yeah. Um, yeah. So essentially, um, I, I, after I went to Harvard, um, I got married, um, had a family. Um, I was just, honestly, I was just living my life and I wasn't writing. I wasn't doing anything outside, um, at all. And then the the pontificate of Pope Francis happened, right. and um, for for the first several years of this pontificate, I I was kind of a low information Catholic, even though I I, I love Catholicism and I find it I find all of this very stimulating and everything. I just I was so swept away with I don't know the I was so swept away with the feeling of newness when he came in that. I, I just wanted to hear good news about him basically for several years. So I I didn't read a lot except for, you know, very kind of fluff pieces about the pontificate. And then for me, the the real turning point was when Amoris Laetitia came out and I started reading. The main website I started reading was Crisis Magazine, which would have um it felt like it would have you know articles about it almost every day you know constantly about it and um i just started catching up on the fact that you know there's there is real controversy going on here there's confusion and ever since then i have just been just kind of riveted to the story of what's going on in this pontificate and and trying to figure him out right i mean that's That that's where I've been, and 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 I, I I defended him publicly for a long time. I did, and I still do. But I wrote a really long piece for Crisis. It was like fifty six hundred words, and it was something like the politically incorrect Francis twelve shocking statements. And I sent it to John Vella, the editor, mm-hmm. right? And Eric Sammons is the editor now, and um, Michael Warren Davis was was between the two. And I sent it to John, and I said. Look, you're going to be shocked. And I said, this is 5,600 words in length, but but you know, look at it. You might you might want to see this. And he looked at it. And he thought about it. And he said, all right, we're going to run the full thing. And so that was a long defense of Francis going through some of his statements that should horrify liberals and should mm-hmm. thrill conservatives. And and yet, ever since that, I think that was probably the last piece that I wrote defending him. Because now I'm just like so many other people, just completely confused by by the guy, and and I mean he he does make really strong statements in defense of, for example, unborn life, right? He's really good in abortion, um, makes mm-hmm. really good statements on things like condemning gender ideology and gender theory, and and still condemns even things like same sex marriage. But on the other hand, he does these things privately and the appointments that he makes and the people that he surrounds himself with. And and I'll tell you, Julia, I just can't figure the guy out. I, I don't know. And then, so this goes right into your book. I can't figure out sometimes when the guy is leading, when he's being led, if he's, um, excuse me for saying this, deceiving or being deceived. He's The guy is really 
kind of maddening to figure out. And it's, you know, to borrow from a Francis phrase, it's kind of made a mess of things. And I, I think for people on both sides ought to feel that way because both sides, whether they, whether a liberal Catholic, conservative Catholic, you have a hard time just knowing what, what the guy really believes. I don't know. Your thoughts yeah. on that? I I think that was extremely well put. I mean, it, it is a very frustrating um, task. And I, I think that kind of early on in the book, so so for anyone who doesn't who hasn't read it yet, the book starts with the conclave of 2005, and Bergoglio is the character because he the the mafia is interested in in getting him elected. And um, when I was writing that 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 section, and I had to do kind of like a quick backstory of who is Bergoglio, wow. um, I put in there, you know, he, he was an enigma to people. Because he had had ultra conservative days where um, he was doing years before he was doing, you know, the kind of conservative things that you were just mentioning, Paul. Um, He was um, acting, acting like an ultra conservative around novices and in teaching and in piety and doing things that were just kind of a throwback to the preconciliar era. And then you you fast forward and then you get to the time when he's the archbishop of Buenos Aires and you have um, one of his friends, um, the Vatican specialist, Elizabeth Piquet, saying that um, people were on his case all the time because he wasn't conservative enough and he was too easy. They thought he was too easy on sexual issues for me, the defining issue that kind of tells me something I can hold on to about Pope Francis is the fact that according to Sandro Magister and others, he allowed everyone who wanted communion in his in his area when he was in Argentina to come up and he didn't refuse communion to anyone. Right. And And to me, that's kind of the bridge. That's Magister makes it clear that the St. Gallen Mafia, according to him, they were watching that and they they knew that about him. And um, that's something that has, you know, became huge with the Casper proposal in the, in the family synods. But to me, to me, I just, I don't think that's, that's the mafia necessarily. I don't know. I just think that's, where we see Pope Francis being Pope Francis um, before he is Pope Francis, so to speak. Um, to me, that gets to the heart of who he might be and what his philosophy on things um, really is. Yeah, in fact, when when I did a review of your book for for the Tan blog, Tan Direction, that's exactly what I focused on because because we had just been through the two visits in November or was it October by um, same month by Nancy Pelosi to the Vatican and then Joe Biden to the Vatican. And we were wondering what what would Pope Francis say to them about communion? And and frankly, it's not clear <laughs> what what he what mm-hmm. he said to them. Again, this maddening uncertainty, right? But but the one thing that you pointed out in your book, he really sees the Eucharist as sort of medicine for the soul, right? For the sick, mm-hmm. for the ailing. So so it's not something that he doctrinally holds out as Okay, if you're not worthy to present yourself for communion, if if you're in a state of mortal sin and you haven't confessed, you should be denied this. You should be denying yourself. He seems to have been doing just the opposite, right? No, you need this then. You need Mm -hmm. this Eucharist more than ever. Of course, the teaching of the church is, uh, but you need to repent. You need to realize that you're sinning, right? Um, You know, you give the medicine to somebody who says, you know, Father, help me, I am sick, right? And then he says, okay, go and sin no more, and now you can have the Eucharist. But but he doesn't seem to go there. His view is just give it, right? Give it, give it to the Eucharist, yeah. give it to them. And that was that was really eye-opening to me, reading, reading that part of your book, precisely at the time that Pelosi and Biden were there at the mm-hmm. Vatican. So I could see taking from your book that. What did Francis really say to Joe Biden? Well, we don't really know, 
But I could see him saying what Biden claimed that he said, right? Which it seems like maybe Biden said this. It's hard to tell from the different news reports, but that um, that you should keep receiving communion, as Biden put mm-hmm. it. I, I could see that as being consistent with where he was in Argentina. Yeah. Yeah, I, I I totally agree. And I think that was, and I remember reading that article that, that you did for Tan Direction and thinking that you, you know, you, you handled it very deftly, um, weaving in the nuances of it, but also the the big picture of, you know, who, who he was in Argentina and where he is, where he is now. I, I think that was, I think it was very illuminating. So, so going back then to him in Argentina, and maybe we should maybe we should pick up with Benedict, right? In um, in 2013, that that was all really illuminating as well in your book. I I did only after reading your book did, did you piece it all together. Did did I I see now that I shouldn't have been surprised really that he stepped down right. This was not um, a lightning bolt out of the blue, right? And mm-hmm. pun intended. The lightning hit the Vatican twice, right? On that mm-hmm. day, twice, twice, twice of all things. But but he had been, in many ways, this was kind of anticipated, right? Maybe we shouldn't mm-hmm. have been surprised uh, in retrospect, or at least knowing what we know now and what you lay out in your book. Yeah, yeah. I think I think that. Um, that that word surprise is is so interesting because um, the, the the first chapter ends on Martini. It's you know at, at the end of Benedict has just been elected pope, and, and then Martini is talking about the new pope, and he says expect beautiful surprises. And yeah. I literally have like sheets of different mafia members giving their little interviews using the same word surprises. He's going to be a man of surprises Um, and and talking about literally, I think one of them was also talking about the God of surprises as well. So (laughs) something surprising is going to happen. And then the surprising thing happens that everyone kind of knew was going to be the surprise. It's very, it happens um, at the very end. It's very interesting. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, it's it's very very interesting, um, but a lot of this when you're in the moment. I remember, I remember when I found out that Benedict was abdicating, and I remember where I was when I found out he was elected pope. Um, I was I was still at Yale when he was elected pope, and I just remember, you know, tears in my eyes, just feeling so relieved and just like he was going to take care of the church and, you know, and be there forever. And then um, when he abdicated, I just remember that, you know, that being punched in the gut kind of feeling like you're, everything has changed. So, so for the average person on the street, you know, it was, it was absolutely shocking and we're still, we're still trying, you know, there's this part of me that understands part of where it came from. And this other part of me that still like feels punched in the gut again, every time I, I, I think about it. So, so I was at, um, I was at morning mass when I learned about him abdicating and the priest came in and told us, and I was shocked. And I remember when he was chosen in 2005, I had just come into the church, my wife and I, and I remember watching it on TV and same reaction, getting tears in my eyes. And I had been through this with Catholic friends for a decade before I kept saying to them, well, what happens if I convert and you guys end up with a bad Pope, right? Or a Pope who, who, who disagrees with all, and they kept saying, you're not gonna get that, that can't happen. A Pope like that can't be possible. And so then, so then Ratzinger was chosen and it was complete reassurance. And of mm-hmm. course, and the issues that I was concerned about in 2005, I think the church is still good on them today, but still you have this confusion. Um, who, who is the, the anti-pope? And this is really, this is an anti-A-N, uh, A-N-T-I, right? But A-N-T-E, right? Mm-hmm. What's, what's the difference between, I guess it'd be ante, right? Anti and ante, but we say anti either way. What, what's the difference? Explain that. 
Yeah. Um, so he would be um, the antecedent, the precursor or preparer for another pope. And um, that was the leader of the St. Gallen Mafia, Cardinal Carlo Maria Martini. Um, Martini is... Um, Martini is, has always been the the real protect. I don't know the heart of this book for me because he's the one that um, when I was reading the Dictator Pope and that first chapter on the St. Gallen Mafia, um, he has different portraits of the characters in the Mafia, and I got to Martini and read it, and just from his eight paragraphs or so about Martini. I was absolutely fixated on on wanting to know more about this character and stopped reading and downloaded Martini's book and and stayed up late at night reading it. So for me, Martini um, is the heart of, of the story because this is his dream. The church that we're living in right now, the, the church of Pope Francis, I completely believe it's it's the dream church of Martini. And it really is, right? I mean, every Catholic ought to know who, who Carlo Maria Martini is. I mean, this is this is really a stunning story. And, mm-hmm. and not only his influence on, on Francis, but I guess going back to, to Benedict XVI and, and his pontificate, his resignation, seeing all of this, all of this that happened, uh, so I, I think is maybe the most fascinating part of the book. So tell, tell us a little bit more about him. Was he... Um, from, from Northern Italy, I think, um, M- Milan, I believe. Yeah, he, he became um, Archbishop of, of Milan, yes. Um, and he he was born, I think, the same year as Ratzinger. So they were, um, they, they, they were parallel in, in many ways. Um, Martini, so he grew up in the, the pre-conciliar church, of course. And um, he talks a lot about his memories of things like um, his his mom would wake him up early on first Fridays so he could receive Holy Communion and then they would celebrate with um, chocolates later on. So he has all these little memories of that world. But then um, with, with the Second Vatican Council, for him, it represented um, a, a new era and a, a new prerogative. And um, he, in 1980, becomes the Archbishop of Milan. And um, right around this time, he's beca- he's beginning to make friends with men who are going to be the, the future mafia members. So he's making friends with Daniels, um, Cardinal Godfrey Daniels. Um, he's making friends with um, Cardinal Basil Hume. Um, they are doing meetings in a group called the CCEE, um, a, a Council of European Bishops. And um, sounds like some Soviet acronym, by the way. The, you know, yeah, the <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and um, he's just kind of growing in 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 power. And in the early '90s, they start to describe him as this next pope there was there was a big article that described him in the london sunday times in that kind of language and um basically a couple things happened to him the first thing is um he was the he became the new president of the ccee and john paul ii effectively ousted him from that position um that was in the early 90s and then um he founds in the mid nineties, he founds the St. Gallen mafia. And our understanding is they wanted Martini to be elected as Pope. So it was his vehicle for ascending all the way, all the way to the papacy really. And then he gets Parkinson's disease and um, it becomes more and more, you know, he, he reveals it in, I believe, 2002. And then by 2005, um, he, he's taking a cane to the conclave. Um, there's no hope that he's going to be Pope, but he's like the Pope maker or the antipope 
already. Um, so that, that, that kind of right. brings us right up to the, yeah, right up to the conclave. And that's right when John Paul II is dying of Parkinson's too. Yes. Um, in, in 2005. So, so you, okay, so you write here on page 178, Martini said to Benedict, this was in uh, June 2012, mm -hmm. the curia is not going to change. You have no choice but to leave. <laughs> you imagine this? And looking the Pope in the eye, according to Martini's confessor, Father Silvano Fausti, Fausti, of all things, right? You know, Fausti and bargain, <laughs> right? Uh, the time for resignation, Martini told Benedict, is now. Nothing can be done here anymore. I mean, it's just, it's just amazing. Tomorrow, except the papacy with my, with my votes, Martini is said to have told Ratzinger in 2005, you accept, since you have been in the Curia for years, you're intelligent and honest, try and reform the Curia, and if not, you leave you leave. And so apparently by June 2012, he was basically telling him you should leave, right? And 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 this is quite interesting too. So you go through this on page 179. Pope Benedict actually expected that the conclave would pick not Bergoglio, but Scola, right? It, who was, who I, I believe, and you go through the votes here, or at least what some have reported the votes to be from the conclave, and I think um, Scola was it Angelo? Was that his first name? He was um, he was in the lead. He probably mm -hmm. should have he probably should have been the next pope, the Italian. And but they but the the St. Gallen Mafia crew that group got Bergoglio right just enough votes to kind of get notice. And then mm -hmm. in the second round, maybe he doubled the total. Right in the third round, maybe tripled the total. You take us through that a little bit. Yeah, um, I think that um, the book talks a little bit about how um, Scola had, he had some weaknesses, so that was part of the story of, of what happened. But really, the, the I think the St. Gallen Mafia alumni, they had learned their lesson from the last um, conclave, and this is what Austin Ivory again pretty much comes out and says. They they knew that they needed to get Bergoglio in the first conclave, according to reports in two thousand five. He only got maybe ten votes, right. and then I think in this in this second conclave in two thousand thirteen, um, he got twenty six votes on the first try. So he went from getting 10 on the first try to 26 on the first try. So they, they really, and they had a meeting that, that the, you know, that the, the book talks about where they tallied how many people were planning to vote Bergoglio and um, they counted 25. So they, they were so well organized that they knew within one vote how many people were going to vote for him. And then it just, um, and, and a lot of it, you know, I wrote down just kind of collecting what we know from what other people have said, but um, how much of this is, you know, like the iceberg theory where it's like, you can only see part of it and then the rest of it is just submerged. We There's so much of this story of this book. This is just what is available in the public documents. Sure. that I can cite in a, in a professional scholarly way. Um, th there's so much hidden or that's implied or that you can kind of um, deduce, but not fully know for certain that that's just in a, lying there in a subterranean way, essentially. Well, and you write on page 101, this is um, an interview that Pope Benedict later did with Peter Sewald, who does so, did so many interviews with him. And he said of the of the choice of Bergoglio as Pope, Seawald asked Benedict, were you expecting someone else? Benedict said, certainly, yes. Not anyone mm -hmm. in particular, but another, yes. And then Seawald said, Bergoglio is not among them, however? And Benedict, no, I did not think he was among the more likely candidates. Although they say he was one of the favorites at the last conclave next to you. That is true, said Benedict. But I thought that is past. 
that is passed. One person not surprised, as you write right before this on the same page, was uh, Cardinal McCarrick, who boasted mm-hmm. to CNN, many of us had thought of it beforehand, the election of Bergoglio, that this might happen. So I was not totally surprised. I was delighted. I was delighted. Yes. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. So the, mm-hmm. all right. So the, the actual St. Gallen mafia, and I can't believe we're already almost 40 minutes into this, uh, this discussion. Um, so here they are, right? It's Cardinals, Carlo Maria Martini, Godfrey De, uh, Daniels, Walter Casper. Uh, you mentioned before Cormac Murphy O'Connor and Achille Silvestrini who was um, a kind of very, I, I hate doing, I hate politicizing this stuff and putting people in Canada, uh, camps of left and right, but he was very, very left of center. In fact, one friend of mine, uh, and I won't say what he said about him, but about, <laughs> I'll probably get quoted and cost trouble. I don't need to, but he was v- very much on the left. So our, so that is, you got Martini, Daniels, Casper, Murphy O'Connor, um, Silvestrini. So that's five right there. Are, are those five kind of the core then of, of what we consider the St. Gallen Mafia? Am I missing somebody? Um, no, I don't think so. I, I kind of, um, those are the names that keep popping up as, as kind of the core group. So I, and, and they all had enough material for me to be able to, you know, devote it different chapters to them as well. So, so for our purposes, we kind of, I've kind of picked them as the core, but there were, there were definitely rotating members, um, you know, people that there, there were people who weren't cardinals yet. They were just bishops and maybe they would come for a couple of years and then rotate out and, and everything. So it, it's very, um, a lot of that part is still, still shadowy and nebulous so and you and you clearly think that the martinis is the most significant which 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 yes. he which he clearly is um silvestrini joined the mafia in 2003 meaning he plotted with them for approximately two and a half years from january 2003 the time of the group's annual meeting to april 2005 the time of the conclave so so he stands out martini stands out the and also then Martini is is the anti pope as well, right? Yes. Uh, A N T E. Mm-hmm. Also standing out here, Casper. Wow, yeah. and I mean Casper probably more than any of these other figures really emerged with Amoris Laetitia, right? Mm-hmm. And and the proposals at the synod that took place, and I guess what was it now? Maybe twenty fourteen. Uh, 2015, where, where we're still trying to figure out what was Francis doing there, right? Was what was he forwarding? What did he believe? Was he was he representing himself? And and um, and, and Daniels too. Daniels is really striking. Uh, what can you say about 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 any any of those figures? Maybe Daniels, maybe Casper. Um, Daniels. Uh kind of shows us the the really dark side of of the mafia because he um for anyone who doesn't know he he's a belgian and um i think around 2010 or so um he was recorded on tape um trying to silence a sexual abuse victim and the victim had been abused by his own uncle um, from the age of five to 18, I believe. And it's really disturbing, the, really disturbing. It, it, it's, yes, it's incredibly disturbing. And this uncle was, a, became a bishop and became a, a protege of Daniil's. And um, Daniil's, when you actually read, and I tried to put in some of the transcripts in the actual book for people to read, but you you hear, you know, the man talking about like, He's saying to Daniels, like, I, why are you always defending my abuser? I, I, I thought I was coming here to get support and help, and you always take his side, things like that. And so it, it, it should have left him in disgrace. It, it was so horrible. 
And yet, um, Daniil's, there's this sermon that he has in his biography, and um, I allude to it in the book, where he he literally, he, he compares his trials, so what he had to suffer from the sexual abuse fallout um, was his Good Friday, and Easter came, he said, because Pope Francis came. And so he he literally is is speaking in multiple ways of a resurrection that he had at Pope Francis's hands, and and we all um, most of the people watching this will have already known about you know the pictures of Daniels um, out the night that Pope Francis is elected Pope, and he's standing there and he's kind of folding his hands in satisfaction. Right, right. He's got this little sliver of a smile on his face and everything. And it's just, um, it, it just speaks of how this group, um, they, they were in the shadows and um, he just, he was there out in the open, right, right there. And um, shortly after Pope Francis was elected, he started making more and more, statements openly in favor of um, gay marriage. Um, he, he had secretly written a letter to um, a, a Belgian politician years before congratulating him on um, a piece of legislation that, that, was, um, that was a pro-gay legislation. And now he's out in the open, just being quoted in the papers about it. So that, to me, it just, when you really think about it and the figure of Daniil's, um, you know, it, it's just enough to kind of give you goosebumps a little bit. And it, and it seems that so many of them want that. They, they want this kind of secularity. You quote Casper saying, uh, just as it is forbidden to clone others, it is not possible to clone Pope John Paul II. Let's not search for someone who is too scared of doubt and secularity in the modern world, right? Yeah. Actually, I want a pope who's scared of secularity in the modern mm-hmm. world, right? That's, that's exactly, exactly what I want. Um, Martini, same kind of thing. This is on page 58. He said the life did not begin immediately with fertilization, but rather sometime later. He said, quote, I maintain the, the, that respect must be granted to every person who, perhaps after much reflection and suffering, follows her own conscience, even if she decides to do something that I do not feel that I can approve of, meaning abortion. Uh, and so later he, re, he reiterated the church's task was not to dispense prohibitions, but to form consciences and teach discernment. And yeah, so they're they're all kind of like this. And you've said a number of times, in fact, this goes into my next question. This is a conversation. This is Theodore McCarrick and Murphy O'Connor. A day after that dinner on March 2nd, the Italian papers quoted an anonymous cardinal as saying, quote, four years of Bergoglio will be enough to change things. Four years. Murphy mm-hmm. O'Connor would later repeat that exact slogan, adding, but pray to God we have them for much longer than that. Well, you have, right? 2013 to 2017 would have been four years. You got at least another four beyond that. McCarrick said he could do it, you know. Um, no, this is what the Italian said. And then McCarrick asked, what could he do? He, Bergoglio, could reform the church. If we give him five years, he could put us back on target. But so that gets to my my question, Julia. What what is the goal? What do they want to reform? What we, you know, we heard all about this phrase, right? Reform the curia. We must reform the curia. Like it's like it was looking back at this now. It's like who cares about the curia? I mean, if if all of this happened because of that, whatever that might be, was it worth it? Um, you know, I'd rather have you know more clear understanding of doctrine and and, and church teaching. But what you know, what what are the goals of of the Saint Gallen Mafia of this of this core of this handful of individuals? What do they want to do? What did they want to do? What do they want? Out yeah. Of this? Um, there are a couple places where we have a pretty clear understanding, you know, straight from from their own mouths of what they want to do. Um, there was this famous speech that Martini gave. 
1999 that delineated some of these goals, but he gave a, he was still kind of speaking in code. You can, you can decode what he's saying, but it's really later on, he spoke to, of all people, Eugenio Scalfari, who um, speaks frequently to Pope Francis and (laughs) there it has these controversial um, and we never know what's what's really said in those conversations either right they're complete mystery every time yeah yeah exactly so so Martini gave an interview to Scalfari and I want to say maybe it's maybe it's around 2008 or so but um, he basically Scalfari asked him okay what are the most important issues in order and then Martini says um, the divorce is number one. Right. Um, number two is, I, I want to say it's the selection of bishops. Number three is priestly celibacy. Number four is, uh, um, the role of the laity. Number five is the relationship between politics and the church or politics and morality. Um, so divorce, the, the the Casper proposal for communion for the right. for the civilly divorced and remarried um, we've we've got that in this pontificate um, we had the Amazon Synod where we were talking about the ordination of married men that covers number three priestly celibacy um, and then the relationship between church and 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 politics um, is it's kind of omnipresent um, here. Um, we were just talking about, you know, Joe Biden and Pelosi and communion and things like that. That's definitely present here. Um, but I think if I had to add to the list, um, I, I think what happened with Traditionis Custodes, the um, just clamping down on the traditional Latin mass, um, that's something right. I don't really cover in the book um, just because it, Traditionis Custodis ended up coming out, out after my book was was done editing and everything. Right. But um, I, I, I've written pieces before where I've said, okay, we can look back and trace what the mafia was doing. And that's that was also presaged by the mafia as well. Yeah. In fact, could you say maybe in retrospect that a kind of binding sort of glue that holds all these guys together, sort of anti-tradition, right? Yes. Um, you know, the the understanding, you know, we need to jump into modernity. We, you know, we need to become more secular. And and I think you say a number of times, too, the whole uh, synodality idea, yes. right, of, of giving local bishops more control, which is exactly what somebody like Daniels would have wanted with you know, the, the the current group of Germans, you know, the the bad Germans currently, what what they what they've wanted to do, and I think you've probably written about this in Crisis the last couple of years. I have, others have. Even Francis seems a little bit shocked by some of what the Germans want to do. Right? They yeah. seem to be getting so um, out of control and unhinged, and maybe going in directions that he didn't expect. But but this is one of my beefs with Francis. He, he appoints these people and embraces them. And, you know, they are from the kind of far left liberal reformist wing of the church. He's, that seems to be the people he's comfortable being around, even if he doesn't seem to always agree with them. And yet when he appoints them and they do the things that they do, then maybe he seems surprised by it. Um, and, and, and so but, you know, that's what this is leading to. And I, and I think this is probably, it's probably what the St. Gallen mafia Core wanted. I almost called him Cabal, uh, but yeah, you know, I think that I, that's probably it's probably where they wanted to go. Yeah, yeah, I definitely agree. And I think the issue with Pope Francis and the Germans is interesting because um, I remember a couple of years ago, um, the Vatican expert Edward Penton, who's, who does phenomenal work, um, he he did a report where he said you know, basically just came right, came right out and said like that there were different Germans who were pushing him to pushing Pope Francis to go faster than he was going on certain things. And, um, I, I think that issue of pacing is so important. Um, my, my, as you know, I, I, I called the second half of my book time, and I have a chapter that is also called time. And then I have a chapter that is called patience 
because um, I think the issue of, of time is, you know, Pope Francis says time is greater than space. The idea is, uh, and, and as opaque as that sounds and, and just kind of out there, um, time is greater than space is basically saying, it's, it's, a, it's another way of saying that um, give something time, give it some patience, go incrementally, and you don't have to dominate spaces in the beginning. You don't have to have everything done in the beginning. You have to have faith in time. And so to me, I am just perpetually fascinated by what the pacing issue that they have here, because we were talking about five years right. um, and Austin Ivory was saying that um, at, he said at one point that Pope Francis had a five year plan that he thought would take seven years. So um, a five year plan that takes seven years brings you up to 2020 and and we don't know yet if that five-year plan that would that needed seven years if it needed a couple more years so maybe it's a nine-year plan now or what exactly we don't know quite what it is but they are literally like they're they're thinking in these types of terms of years and and how much how much time do we need so i i definitely see that as kind of an obsession with them yeah, and the fact that we don't know what the plan really is has a very kind of deceptive quality to it. And I think that's what really troubles me. The, you know, the church shouldn't be like that. Everybody should yeah. know what the church believes, what the Pope believes, what the Pope wants to do. The idea, and we saw it at that first synod on the family where he seems to be telling some of his guys, no, that's too, that's too much. You pull back, slow down, slow down. You shouldn't do that. That that has a kind of deceiving nature to it. You know, just go fight for what you believe and put it out there. If if unless you're afraid to put out what you really believe, which which I guess they are. So a lot of times these goals and what reform even means is just so unclear. And, and in the process, it's just again to borrow from Pope Francis, it's made a mess of things. Yeah. So 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 you close this. With with uh, with a, the section on indeed time, and you quote the Italian historian Roberto De Mattei, who just did a great book on Pope Pius V through um, through Sophia Institute Press, and he says here we are living and it, it, you, he quote you quote a um, a Latin phrase motus in fine uh, uh, velocior. I don't know if I said that right. Motion accelerates toward the end. Time passes more swiftly at a period's close. And here you quote Roberto de Mattei. We are living through, through an historical hour, which is not necessarily the end of times, but certainly the end of a civilization and the termination of an epoch, an epoch in the life of the church. I mean, that's pretty, yeah. what does that all mean? And you conclude for a clock wound up with its inexorable ticking and the revol uh, for a clock wound up with with its inexorable ticking and the revolutionaries had to hurry and really that's what they are right they really are revolutionaries for some dreams like Martini's are finally as fleeting as lightning destined destined to FNS while somewhere in the Sistine Chapel the Christ of the Last Judgment gazes on so. That's that's a pretty strong ending. Tell us tell us what you mean by that. Unpack that for us. <laughs> um, I when I thought about you know kind of like dominant images. So so again, I'm a I'm an English major. I'm a literature person. Like symbols, themes. Um, I, I've written short stories before, so I've these kinds of things are really important to me. And I tried to write this in a way where it's, it's like, um, like a term paper and it's got footnotes, but it's also kind of like reading a novel, you know, and it's got right. characters, symbolism, really all of that sort of thing. Um, so I thought about it and we keep hearing about the, the Christ in um, the Sistine Chapel, um, the Christ of, of, of the Last Judgment um, fresco. And, and, and he's kind of, you keep hearing about him, but you kind of don't know what he's doing or 
it, it doesn't really become clear. And then I think at the end, the dominant image that I wanted to leave people with was this idea that, um, okay, so we're obsessed with time. The revolutionaries are obsessed with time, but they they only have an hour or they, they have this limited period that they can work with. I don't know what it corresponds to in earthly terms. I don't know. I just know that it's limited and they know that it's limited. That's why they're, they're constantly anxious. They can't go too fast. Right. Um, they, they, they know that they can't be like the Germans and they can't catapult everything into schism or chaos or anything like that. But they also know that they can't go too slow. Um, so they have to find the right amount of time and they have to find the right opportunities. And um, at, at the end of the day, though, like at the last judgment, at the real last judgment, we will look back on this and we will think about how this was a finite period of chaos in the church and the Christ of the last judgment was in control all along. And he's, mm -hmm. I don't know quite how he's going, you know, we don't know the details about how he's going to get us out of this, but um, we are going to get out of it at, at some point. So I wanted to just kind of, kind of evoke some of those larger feelings and larger, a larger context for what's going on. That's very good. So it's a very, it's, it's a very optimistic actually, right? Conclusion. Yeah. So it, it, you don't go into this, but who will succeed Francis? I mean, you don't go through the number of people, the cardinals that he's appointed that can vote in the next conclave, the ones that have passed that were under Benedict and John Paul II. By the way, wouldn't it be shocking if if Francis dies before Benedict the Sixteenth does? I mean, with the, I know. With, the way, with the way that the, all of this is going, and yeah. he's gotten eight years, he's going on nine. They thought they only needed five, maybe six or seven at the most. So you know they've gotten more time than they thought. And even then, for whatever reform or goals that it was that they can't tell us about, I don't know if they've really gotten them. I think what they've just gotten is again a mess of things yeah. that's left a lot of people on on uh, on all sides confused and frustrated. But mm -hmm. but what um, who's the next pope? What do you, what do you think? Where does it where does this go next? Um, I I really I don't know. Um, I I know that there was recently an article in the National Catholic register um that was talking about um cardinal zuppi um as he, basically he would be someone who is absolutely um committed to finishing what what pope francis started um yeah. so he he would be in his image him as a likely contender if he can get the votes um right. and Which might basically some more scheming yeah, they were they, what they were talking about in a in a kind of coded way was they were talking about different groups that were backing him and already um, making themselves known. And you always wonder with that. Um, well, if everyone already knows about this, is he going to be successful, or is he just the one that will, everyone thinks is going to win? And there's right, right. going to be a dark horse um, elsewhere. So I I don't quite. I don't quite know. Um, I go back and forth on how much hope we have for the pendulum swinging the other way. But I, I sure. think we probably most likely we're, we're going to get someone, whether we know his name now or, or, or he's more unknown. I think we're probably going to get someone in, in the image of, of Francis and someone probably who um, has some kind of group, uh, even if it's not the mafia, some kind of group work, you know, working for him um, in, in some sense, trying to build up hype and, and get the votes and and do that sort of thing. Which is which is not how it's supposed to go. It's not how it's yeah. supposed to operate. John yeah. Paul II even explicitly forbade that, right? Mm -hmm. um, all right. Well, well, this has been great. So tell us, do you do you have, are you going to do another book? Do you have plans for another book? Maybe on Catherine uh, of Siena. <laughs> I um, I would love to do another book at some point. I'm just 
like I feel like my my brain is so fried from kind of all all the different all the work that I've done that I can't even I, I don't even know what I would do. Um what, you need what inspired. I would do my next you need, book the, on. you need the right yeah. topic, right? Something like this yeah. that really that really inspires you and you and you wonder why hasn't anyone written a book on this, right? And, then, yeah. and then at, that, at that point, as an author, so I've been through this, sometimes you think, well, I guess maybe I'm supposed to do it, right? I mean, yeah, exactly. So I don't know if it's if it's going to be something like some people have kind of thrown thrown the idea, like maybe if I wrote kind of like a part two of of the St. Gallen Mafia or a, sure. like something that's a companion or something. Um, it's always a possibility or I, I could do something totally different, you know, a, a different historical figure or Fatima or something, something just, you know, of a different time period as well. So right, I'm right. not sure. Wait till the, wait till lightning strikes the Vatican twice again. And <laughs> yes. That'll, that'll, that'll do it. So do you, do you have a website? Um, yeah. Um, I, it, it's just Julia Maloney.com. Okay. All right. So, so people can follow you there. And also your writings for Crisis, and um, you write for LifeSite News too, I believe, right? Sometimes, um, yes. Sometimes I write for them as well. Um, I also write for One Peter Five. Yes, um, yes. I've I'm seen pre- your I'm there. pretty, and I'm I'm pretty active on Twitter um, as okay. well. I'm Julia Maloney One. Okay. On Twitter. All right, and Steve Cunningham will put that up on the screen as well as you know your book, The St. Gallen Mafia. So so this has been great. Thanks so much for, for doing this. Really appreciate it, and you know, God bless your work. Keep it up. Thank you so much. I appreciate it so much. And thanks, everybody, for joining us. We'll do another one of these podcasts again in a few weeks. We do, we do one about once every month on average. So we will talk to you again soon. Go to the Tan Books website, especially now at Christmas time, and load up. Give give away some of these books for for Christmas. These are I can't think of better Christmas presents than some of the books in the in the Tan Books catalog. So everybody, take care. God bless, and we'll see you again next time.